So, dear, do you know, did we get it uh, working? The website? You might just see if it's there. Father, I don't know what's going on. Uh, the ambulance came up the road earlier, and now it's here again with the fire engine. I just pray, Lord, who's ever in crisis right now, that they will know that you, the God of angel armies, is there with them. And that they will not be afraid. I pray for the peace that they may need to experience right now. The peace of your touch. They, they, need, they may need a miracle right now, God. And I pray for that miracle for whoever that person is. And I pray that somehow whoever's involved, that all of them there would know the love of Jesus Christ. And that you would put somebody there who can touch them with that love. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. It's working. Oh, good. It's working. Well, good job, girl. <laughs> so that means Kathleen Shepherd, we get to say hello to you. Okay. So everyone say hi, Kathleen. Hi, Kathleen. There you go. Okay, Kathleen. And everyone else who's watching online who's unable to be with us, um, this is a that opportunity. This is the beauty of the what we've just been through, right? With this virus, is the churches all got sent away. And everyone had to really fast learn how to get online. And that's one of the blessings that's come out of this whole experience with this virus, is that the church has gotten online. The littlest of churches, even like us, <laughs> have a presence now online that can reach anywhere in the world. That's amazing. Amen. And that these messages, and look, what we just did in Daniel for the last several weeks, that those for that, the prophecy of Daniel and what we were looking at as we looked at that in Revelation, guess what? It's out there to stay. Which is, by the way, a, a warning about the internet. Be careful what you put on it because it stays there. Okay. So, so if you're going to say something nasty about your wife or your husband, I suggest not doing it online unless you never want to live down what you said about them. Okay? It's really... <laughs> Just be careful what you put on the internet, and that should be a, a lesson for all of us anyways, to be careful about what we what we put out. We shouldn't be saying things that later we would be embarrassed about anyway, should we? So control your tongue, I guess, is another word for us this morning. But, but today we're going to get into this um, series, uh, I Will Not Be Afraid. And there is a lot of reason for fear, isn't there? I don't know about you, but did any of you ever feel afraid of the boogeyman at nighttime? A few of you did. Yeah, thank you, thank you. No guys are going to admit it, huh? Well, I used to be afraid of the boogeyman, and especially because it, it seemed like we regularly had some boogeyman around our house. My mom would oftentimes see that boogeyman. I often never did, but just the fact that she saw it and would even call the sheriffs and I'm like, oh no, there's a boogeyman. There. So the dark is not a fun place to be in. I mean, and, and think about it. In fact, we're going to learn some things this morning. <clears throat> Billy Graham in 1965 said, historians will probably call our era the age of anxiety. Anxiety is the natural result when our hopes are centered in anything short of God and his willfulness. That was 1965. Today, the anxiety level of our young people has hit the roof. The, the amount of young people who have anxiety attacks, and we're not talking about, oh, well, it's just they're thinking of it, no, of their imagination. No, this is real life anxiety attacks that, that just drive them literally crazy. Young people are suffering from anxiety way more than what Billy was even seeing back in 1965. We are clearly in an age of anxiety. <clears throat> Jessica Kastner uh, has written an article, Hiding from the Kids in My Prayer Closet. Hiding from the Kids in My Prayer Closet. <laughs> it's, their, it's their one place to get away, right? To get, get into the quiet and get away from all the noise. But she says, when I think about the root cause of so many mistakes and spiritual pitfalls in my life, the source seems to be the one and only the ugly fear. Fear will cause us to buckle and settle for less than God's best. 
It'll cause us to disobey after diluting our trust in him. And even when we do stay strong, it'll rob us of our peace and joy. Fear. She actually goes on and says this. God actually commands us not to fear or worry. The phrase fear not is used at least 80 times in the Bible, most likely because he knows the enemy uses fear to decrease our hope and limit our victories. I've been a Christian for 15 years now, she said, and I'm still in awe that God who created the universe cares about every detail of our lives. We belong to an all-powerful, all-knowing, victorious Father who cares deeply about us. When we really meditate on this truth, it's hard to remain fearful about the trials we face. By focusing on him and how he considers us his prized, redeemed ones, our focus naturally shifts from fear to faith. Some people say you have to have more faith. But how do you increase your faith? Well, let me suggest this. You increase your faith not by trying to build it up inside of yourself. You increase your faith by getting closer to Jesus. So when you're afraid, get closer to Jesus. And by being in his presence, it will actually increase faith and remove and dispel fear. The text we're looking at for today is from Psalm 27. I, did, I read to you earlier the second half of that psalm. I'm especially focusing on the first three verses, but we'll, we'll go a couple verses beyond that to verse 6. And, and so verse... Psalm 20... Did I say Psalm 27? Yeah. Okay, thank you. All of a sudden I thought I said Psalm 23, which was a great psalm too and has a word about fear in it too, right? I, I, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will what? Fear no evil. Why? Because God is with me. There, look there. Look how faith gets built because you're getting close to Jesus, you're getting close to the Lord. So Psalm 27, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord is my light and my salvation. The Lord is the stronghold. Excuse me, I skipped the phrase that's most important. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evil men advance against me to devour my flesh, when my enemies and my foes attack me, they will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then I will be confident. And by the way, look at the prayer then that the psalmist prays. One thing I ask of the Lord, this is what I seek that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. Isn't that what we're trying to do right here? Now, obviously, we are the temple of God, right? So you can, you can get into the temple of God any place by yourself, but there's something unique and special about God's people getting together like he commanded for in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his tabernacle and set me high upon a rock. Then my head will be exalted above the enemies who surround me. At his tabernacle will I sacrifice with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. By the way, underline that one. Because that is a key part of us defeating fear. And it's why we're here today. <clears throat> we are under attack by a spirit of fear. Do you remember all the statistics that we heard when we first started learning about the virus back but just, just before March 11th even? Before we had the shutdown? Do you remember the numbers that, that we were hearing? That, that every intensive care was going to be overloaded. 
that we were going to run out of all of those breathing machines, the respirators. And in fact, the governor of New York actually said, we need thousands more. We don't have near enough. They sent the two Mercy ship and oh, they sent them out to the East Coast and West Coast because we were anticipating not just thousands upon thousands and millions getting sick, but we were anticipating the thousands that would overwhelm every single hospital system all across this country. And as we heard that, what did we feel? Didn't we feel fear? Concern? Oh my, how bad could it get? The President of the United States is standing in front of us and saying, look, here's the projections, and the projections are terrible. It could have been a third of this room would have the virus and, and half of them were all going to die. How many of you have already written up your will and you said you don't want to be on a respirator at the end of your life? None of you? <laughs> I have. <laughs> when it's time to go, I want to go. I don't want to sit there on a machine. Amen. I watched my dad sit there when he said, Bill, you need to, you're, you're the one, you're, you have the medical power of attorney for me. And, and, um, and he went into intensive care and he, they, had, they started doing uh, the kidney work on him. Um, they started, uh, they, they put the breathing machine down, the tube down his throat and all. And, and he said, and, and as he was going into it, he said, Bill, I, I want you to keep it going. Oh my. They put him on dialysis. One day they came and they said, okay, well, and he had actually come back kind of out of it for a bit. Enough for me to say, Dad, do you want this to continue? And he said, yes. And it was a day or so later that the doctor said, we need to do an oblation on his lungs. You know what an oblation is? It's where they go in and they're going to scrape out the lungs. And there's no way for you not to feel it. And finally, we got to the point where we, sit, we were standing there with the nurses in, our, in Dad's room. And I'm like, this just doesn't feel right. What we're putting him and his body through. And I'm standing there with one of the nurses, and I made that comment. And she said, we have been wondering why you are putting him through all this pain. Because my dad gave me the power to decide. And because my dad, in the last conversation, still said, yes, keep going. And so I called my sister, who's back east, got her on the line, gave her an opportunity to speak to dad without dad hearing, or excuse me, without dad responding. We sang a few songs when we turned off the equipment. And we let him go. And what we were hearing about at the beginning of this virus was, was it going to be millions that are going to be on a breathing machine like that? And as you kept listening, particularly if you listen to doctors in those intensive care wards and the, and the nurses, but especially nurses who were trying to care for these patients, and no one was allowed to go in with them. And anyone that went into the room had all the, the, the various personal uh, protective equipment on. And so there was no touch, no family member allowed to be there. Nurses and doctors were getting discouraged and, and feeling and grieving because they were saying, no loved one can be with the person. These people are dying alone. And then they said, and we all know, we all know that the odds are when you get on the breathing machine, you're not coming off. It's why we started then seeing, what was it, two months later, a month later, and we started to see people coming out of the hospital after having been on a respirator, and the whole hospital staff was out there applauding because someone made it. Someone survived, one of those few, after having been on the breathing machine. And so aren't, isn't there a bit of us that says, 
I don't want to be on that machine. And how many people, as they were watching the news and seeing those reports, say, and I don't want to go in that hospital. I don't want to be in there by myself and die alone. Mm. And that was part of the fear that was spreading across not just our state or our country, but across the entire globe. Folks, we do not have a spirit of fear, but spirit of power, of love, and self-control. Let me read that to you in three different versions. 2 Timothy 1, 7 in the NIV, For the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. In the New Living Translation, For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. New American Standard, For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and discipline. We are under attack by a spirit of fear that wants to destroy the work of the kingdom of God. And that is not from Christ. The one from Christ is a spirit of power, of love, and self-control. I was listening to um, Hugh Hewitt on Saturday morning, and he was doing his weekly review, and, and he talked about and was had a lady on that actually Prager had interviewed earlier in the week. And I remember, oh yeah, I remember hearing that interview. The lady's name is Heather McDonald. She wrote a book titled The War on Cops. As a guest of Dennis Prager, she said this. As we have been interviewing people in the African American community, in the black community, they have been saying, we want more police, not less. She went on to say, I am afraid, well, she was quoting some of the people, she said, I'm this lady said, I'm afraid to go to my meal. This is a metaphor. We are turning the lights out on our civilization. It was the signal achievement, listen to this phrase, it was the signal achievement of Western civilization to banish humanity's millennial-long fear of the dark through science, electricity, and public order. What do you do when you're afraid of the dark? Turn the light on. Right? Little children, show them around the room. Go into the closet where they think the boogeyman is staying. Okay? Show them there's no boogeyman there. If you go out into the dark in the middle of the night and you're afraid, what do you do? Get a bright flashlight. We have some really bold ones now, right? And you shine the light and you can see what's around you. And if there is something there, you'll blind them anyways. <laughs> It was the signal achievement of Western civilization to banish humanity's millennial-long fear of the dark. And they did it how? Through science, electricity, and public order. What it felt like in the past weeks was the fall of night. You were fearful. It was like being in the Middle Ages. You worried about witches and gnomes in the forest and actual rampaging highwaymen. We are losing the businesses of civilization at an extraordinary rate. She goes on to say, civilization is fragile because human beings have a passion for destruction and for tearing things down. Anyone see any evidence of that in the last few weeks? Breaking glass is fun, did you know that? The idea that these riots were out of sorrow and regret is preposterous. You had protest and you had riots and you had different people on both sides. These people were having the time of their lives and the precedent that has been set. The multiple failures of government that we have seen over the last three months are stunning. The first, to destroy the economy. The second, to fail to maintain public order, which is the first service and most important duty of government. And then ceding the streets to anarchists. <coughs> The president has been set, she said. From now on, people know that if they are not getting their way, they can loot and pillage, shoot at cops, firebomb cops, destroy their cars, and there will be no consequences. She warned even that 
What happens if you have less police officers? What happens if those police officers are caught in a situation with somebody who's becoming violent and they have no backup because we reduced the police force? She said, listen to this, if officers don't get backup, they are more likely to resort to legal force, not less likely. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is my light. Think about some of what John told us in, in, when, when he was describing Jesus. In fact, John 8, verse 12, when Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. When you're in the dark, turn the light on. John 3, Jesus is speaking with Nicodemus, and he comes to this point with Nicodemus. He says, this is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. <laughs> Didn't you find it interesting at all that the looting and the fire burning and the throwing of bricks and rocks all took place in the dark when people could hide out? Chickens, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'll try to watch my editorial comments here. Verse 20, everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. That's what Jesus was describing. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. We received an anonymous check this week for $1,000 for the food distribution through Mountain Help. $1,000. Wow. Amen. Yes. And it came from a person in the community who said, I've seen you working. I've seen what you're doing. I've seen you don't just talk about it, but you regulate out there serving. And she gave us a thousand dollars. Because God says, what you do in the light will be seen plainly. Amen. But what you do in the dark, you're doing it to try to hide. And then in that very first chapter of John, what did John the Baptist say? Or, or I should say, John, as he's writing it, he writes in verse one, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God and the word was God he was with God in the beginning through him all things were made without him nothing was made that has been made in him was life and that life was the light of all mankind the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it and what is John saying Jesus, the light, is shining in the darkness, and darkness cannot overcome light. Incidentally, you realize that, right? Light, darkness is nothingness. Put light there, and it can be the little tiniest amount of light, but it pushes darkness away. The tiny little match that burns, the tiny little candle, or how about this? Just the little red laser on your laser pen pushes the darkness away. And Jesus is the light that pushes the darkness away. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light, the true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. John saw the light. The disciples saw the light. Have we seen the light? The Lord is my light. The Lord is my salvation. The psalmist says, he's the light that puts away the darkness, but he's also my salvation. 
He's the one who comes to give me life forever. He's the one who comes to forgive my sins. He's the one who comes to give me new life. Let's go back to the story right there. Just as Jesus is being born, Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, right? At the birth of John, has this great announcement, and he celebrates now this baby who's going to be declaring Jesus is the light. In verse 67 of Luke 1, it says his father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit, and he prophesied, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come to his people and redeemed them. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. As he said through his holy prophets long ago, salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us to show mercy to our ancestors and to remember his holy covenant. The oath he swore to our father Abraham to rescue us from the hand of our enemies and to enable us to serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days. And you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him. He will save us from what? Our enemies. Revelation says the last enemy that will be destroyed is what? Death. I'm not sure, is that still our greatest fear? Yeah, or being on a ventilator. <laughs> he will rescue us from our enemies. That's what salvation is. He will rescue us from the enemy of darkness. The enemy name is, named Satan. The enemies who are principalities and powers and rulers of darkness in heavenly places, he will save us from them. He will save us from our enemy, the spirit of fear. In Acts, verse, chapter 4, verse 12 says, Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which, by which we must be saved. And what's that name? Jesus. Jesus. Some of you thought I had a trick answer because you were really too quiet on that one. Okay. There, there's a name above every name on earth. It's the name through which salvation will come. It will come through no other. And what is that name? Jesus. Okay, I'm just making sure you all have the answer. Maybe I had it wrong. I don't know. Paul, in speaking about the spiritual battle that we are in, where he warns us that we're not fighting flesh and blood, but we're fighting principalities and powers, that there are rulers in heavenly places. The spirit of Antichrist is across this globe, folks. Attack, excuse me. And the spirit of fear is attacking across this globe, wants us to be controlled by fear. Isn't that why, why you use fear? To try to manipulate and control people? That spirit is out there and attacking. And listen what Ephesians 6, 17 says. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. We're supposed to cover our heads. Have you thought about where fear starts? It starts in your thoughts. It starts in what you think. It starts in your mind. Fear begins there. And notice the helmet of salvation covers what? Not your knees. It covers your head or your thinking sometimes wrong. The helmet of salvation, we are protected by this new relationship we have with Jesus Christ who saves us. Well, I think Psalm 27 has a parallel in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 8 and 9, when Paul says, But since we belong to, this day, to the day, not to the night, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate, and the hope of salvation as a helmet, for God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord is my light. The Lord is my salvation. And then the psalmist says, and the Lord is my stronghold. The Lord is my protector. 
The Lord is that fortress. That's what a stronghold is. A, a place where, where you're surrounded by a fortress that's going to protect you. But take note. God's people are not supposed to stay in the fortress. They go to the fortress to get refreshed. They go to the fortress to get re renewed. They go to the fortress to get new resources. And then they go back out onto the battlefield. Because you don't want to sit there in a place of defense in the fortress. The fortress is that stronghold that guarded you so that you could go out into the battle. And by the way, the even cooler thing about that is God is the fortress that goes with you into the battle. Folks, the masks will only protect us so much. I believe it's my friend Paul who, who said to me, really, the masks protect you from me. Right? <laughs> so, so if I'm sneezing, um, then, okay, by me sneezing on, into the mask, I'm not sneezing on you. Correct? And with all the allergies, is anyone else sneezing? It's not with COVID, but some other reasons. <laughs> So, so the mask, in fact, now, now we keep learning about all these things of how dangerous the mask is. We have people who have oxygen issues they are not, not you know, told by doctors, don't wear the mask. Uh, by the way, think about it, you're getting carbon dioxide in here, right? I think that's not a good thing, right? Okay. Carbon dioxide, you're taking that in the mask. So here's the challenge. The very thing that we've been hoping protects us may actually be causing new problems. But that's the way the world is. The Lord... What's that? Allergies? Allergy season. It's, I know it is. And, and you have, now you have to wear a sign that says, I have allergies. That's, not, that's why I'm sneezing. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Otherwise, somebody's going to get really ticked off at you. Why are you out here in public? <laughs> okay, we're getting off. The Lord. The Lord is my stronghold. Nothing else. You can remain totally in a queue without anyone else around. And guess what? You still might get the virus. We can't totally protect ourselves, can we? But we need to trust the Lord who is our fortress, our strength, our protector. Moses said, the Lord is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. Oh, by the way, Moses was saying that right about the time that the Pharaoh and his army was coming about to, to, to destroy Israel after they're out there in the desert. Except that God had a plan, and it was called walking across on dry ground on the Red Sea. It's 2 Samuel 22, verse 3. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation. He is my stronghold, my refuge, my savior from violent people. You saved me. It's Psalm 18, verse 2. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. Could we, if you want to submit there, I take refuge, my mask. <laughs> isn't that what a shield is? Uh, isn't, that, isn't a mask a shield? Yeah. I think. Am I missing it, Wade? No. A mask is a shield. And he's saying, look what? He's saying, I'm the shield. God is the shield. God is the protector. The horn of my salvation. Psalm 62, verse 2, and then 6 and 7. Truly, he is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will never be shaken. Truly, he is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will not be shaken. My salvation and my honor depend on God. He is my mighty rock, my refuge. Whom then, whom then shall I fear? Now I understand a little bit why David says whom, because he's dealing with soldiers, enemies, 
We're not sure, Psalm 27, did David write that because he's running from Saul, the king, or from Absalom, his son? It's one of them, and he's left the, the throne, and worse than that, he's left the place that has been the most refreshing place for him. He's left the place that blessed him the most. He's left the tabernacle of God. Remember, this is even before the, temp the temple, right? Temple is built by Solomon, so there's no temple with David. But there's still the tabernacle. There's still the meeting place with God that David would go to to get into the presence of God. And then David, even as he's praying this psalm, he's saying, I'm finding my presence with you, God. I'm finding my peace, my hope, my confidence, because you're my light, you're my salvation, you're my stronghold, you protect me. God, whom shall I fear? No matter who's out there coming after me. Whom shall I fear? We don't need to fear the spirit of fear. We don't need to fear the darkness anymore. We don't need to fear COVID-19. Because frankly, folks, if we die, <laughs> we live. We're with Christ. In fact, Romans 8, verse 31, is such a great place for us to start bringing this to a conclusion. I'm sorry, I didn't type this one out ahead of time. What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? Who, he, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who is he that condemns? Christ Jesus who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? By the way, notice that we're in a bunch of who's, aren't we? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger, or sword, or coronavirus, COVID-19, as it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. I think that's some of how the nurses and doctors felt, right, Paul? <laughs> We're the ones on the front line, right there, gonna get sneezed on, right, Paul? Yeah, doing the tests, no less. And, oh my goodness, knowing all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Whom shall we fear? As the psalmist wraps up this section, listen what he says. One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent and set me high upon a rock. Then my head will be exalted above the enemies who surround me at, at his sacred tent. I will sacrifice with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. 
Hear my voice when I call, Lord. Be merciful to me and answer me. My heart says of you, seek his face, your Lord, you Lord, your face, Lord, I will seek. I'm going to back up because I don't want you to miss that. My heart says of you, seek his face, your face, Lord, I will seek. Folks, we have to worship. We have to worship. It's not because we need to just have parties together. It's not just because, oh, we need acquaintances and, you know, we're lonely and we need to, you know, get out and see some people. We <clears throat> need to worship together. That's what God's called us to do. That's what God's created us to do. Notice David, as he's out here afraid of all the enemies and he's, as he's dealing with all them, he says, there's one thing I want, God. I want to go back and sing and worship. And I know that if you were doing worship when we weren't meeting here together, that some of you sang, right? Right? Some of you let some others sing, right? Instead of you, right? But see, singing is something we have to do together. It's, it's, we have to worship together. And so that's why, why David's saying it. It's why you're here today, I hope. <laughs> because you're saying, I have to worship the Lord and sing with his people and praise him. And I still find it interesting that one of the final restrictions they tried to put on the church was, don't sing. <laughs> okay, and, 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 you know, you can put your mask on so that you don't get any of the rest of us with your spit. But, but we needed to sing. We needed to sing and to worship God. The Lord is my light. The Lord is my salvation. The Lord is my stronghold. And even though I might be afraid at times, the Lord is with me. I probably need to do one last comment. If someone is more afraid than you, show them love not disrespect. <laughs> Don't try to force yourself into their face. <laughs> if, if somebody puts out their elbow, don't grab them and say, no, I'm not doing that. <laughs> Respect them. Didn't we have a responsibility to love one another? In fact, don't we have a responsibility to care for people who might be weaker than us? And I just have to ask you, how do we know which one of us is weaker? Okay, hopefully that will sink you. How do we know whether if I'm the weaker brother, not you? The Lord's my light. The Lord's my salvation. The Lord's my stronghold, my protector. And because the Lord's in me, I love. Most of you here today, I think you're here because you love Jesus already. You've committed your life to him. But maybe you need to do some cleaning up. Because that's one of the things that I sense that Jesus is doing with his church. He's trying to clean his body. He's trying to purify us. If you've ever prayed for revival, then you've prayed for the church to get clean. Don't forget. That prayer begins with you. It starts with you getting cleaned up, purified, becoming more like Jesus Christ. And if anyone's listening to this online, even a thousand years from now, or decades, or you're in the middle of the tribulation, if you say yes to Jesus, he will be merciful. He will forgive you. And he'll give you a new life. And no matter what enemy you're facing, you'll know God's with you. Father, 
May that truth encourage us this day. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. amen.